so to 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 kick start like i already mentioned who currently this is of course our governing body as health workers the world health organization is labeling climate change as the biggest health threat that we are facing as humanity and is calling upon all health workers to really invest in studying more and researching more. Uh, most of us, lucky enough, are still in first year. So as we move to the years of conducting study and research, this is an area that we can really pick interest up and find out what are some of those measures we can use to mitigate the effects of climate change, to build on the body of research that we have on the impacts of climate change in health. Um, climate change, like we have all had, and sometimes we always confuse it. This is usually, it's a normal process, by the way, first and foremost. This is a normal process. It's usually a long-term alteration in temperature, precipitation, which is the rainfall patterns, the wind patterns, and other ailments of the Earth's climate system. So it happens after a very long time, or even it can even take thousands of years to change. But this comes with certain effects. It could either be positive or negative effects. Unfortunately for us, for this century we are in right now, the change that has happened is to a greater extent affecting us negatively. So we are grappling with the effects of climate change and not the and not climate change as it is, but the effects, the outcomes of the change that we are seeing in the temperatures, in the weather patterns, rainfall and wind patterns. So yeah, just to, to put that out clear, we are grappling with the effects of climate change and not climate change as it is, because it's a normal occurrence, but what results, what results from this occurrence is what we either enjoy or suffer with. Okay, and um, some of the indicators of climate change, once you, you see some of these uh, signs, you know that we have moved into another se season or another century or decade of our weather patterns changing and temperatures. One is uh, the increase in the global temperatures. I think this we have all witnessed, even the coldest places on earth right now, temperature levels have increased and the they always show this on different channels of media, on news. Then also we have the coolest mountains, the ice caps, the glaciers, they've started to melt down. So we are having reduction in ice caps. And then also another indicator is the rising sea levels. Each and every now and then we are hearing uh, rivers are busting. We are hearing high, high levels in sea waters so sea levels once they rise there's also this also informs us that there is something that has changed in our weather patterns in our temperature and wind patterns and then also there are more frequent and severe weather events yeah out of the blue you see hailstones when you do not even expect them or you have Maybe the meteorological center has declared that in the next three months we shall have heavy rains and then you don't witness any rains. So these extreme and severe weather events are also indicators of change in climate. Then also there's alterations in the rainfall patterns, like I have already also highlighted earlier. Uh, you're expecting, especially for the people in the agricultural sector, you're expecting rains in the next month, you prepare everything and then no rains show up. So we are seeing a lot of changes in, in seasonalities. Other countries, for example, here um, we had three patterns and now we have two. And I also believe in, in South Sudan, it's the same issue. Rainfall patterns have really, really reduced. And this already indicates that there is change in the in the climate. Then also temperature variations. Sometimes it's too hot, sometimes it's too cold, and really unfavorable for agriculture as a sector, but also for health. We are having rising skin cancers, skin diseases, heat burns, people 
especially for the children and the newborns, this is really affecting them. The high variations in temperatures. Then we also have increased intensity and frequency of extreme weather. Too much rainfall. The next morning you wake up, it's too dry. The other day it's too cold and too wet. So these are all indicators of climate change. And we are living this reality right now in all the countries globally and it's something we have to also come together as health professionals to see how do we protect the health of the of the humans but also the health of for the veterinary people the health of the animals but also environment um some of the causes of climate change we have uh, the greenhouse emissions the carbon dioxide the methane the nitrous oxide, and this is from our day-to-day -day lives, the continuous fossil fuel burning, deforestation, even the appliances we use at household level, the refrigerators, these really emit a lot of methane gas. So these all contribute to greenhouse gases, and once the more greenhouse gases we, we emit to environment, to the atmosphere, this affects precipitation. It affects rainfall formation and the result is either an acidic rain or very low rainfall formation. Another cause is deforestation. This is the cutting down of trees and we should appreciate trees play a very vital role, especially in carbon dioxide absorption and release of oxygen gas that we use for our respiration. But the more we cut down trees, the growing population, we are encroaching on the natural trees that we had, but also replacing them is a challenge. Yeah, we cut down and we don't want to replace. So this is also really, really contributing to the climate change we are having in this century. Uh, three, also agricultural practices, fine. We need to achieve food for food security for all. We need to, uh, to achieve nutritious meals for the community, for the population. But at what cost, at what expense are we doing this? We are opting out more for use of artificial fertilizers. We are opting out for a lot of unhealthy agronomic practices, which are also contributing a lot to greenhouse emission greenhouse gas emissions in the long run, contributing to the negative effects of climate change we are observing currently. For the growing industrialization, right now, everything we are using at household level, we are consuming, even the cars we are using, most of the things go through an industrial process, go through a procession, and this all contribute as well to greenhouse gas emissions. And it's now even worse for the African continent that we even don't have mechanisms to address some of these gas emissions, especially, for example, at industrial levels. People, everyone just wakes up and sets up an industry, a factory, without putting in place measures that preserve the environment and also control or purify the gases that they release from their production processes. So these are some of the causes of, of climate change. There are a lot more, very, very many causes, and these are the major categorized causes. Then moving forward to microbes, if there are no questions, but if there's a question, please unmute and ask. Um, microbes, this is very familiar with us all as health professionals. These are tiny living organisms that we can't see with our naked eye. Yeah, this is a definition that is standard from the day you're introduced to science up to the higher levels of medicine you'll go to or public health you'll go to. It's a standard definition. And um, the different types of microbes, we have the bacteria which live usually in soil, water, and also we have the healthy bacteria that lives in the human body that we can't do without. 
until it becomes or it lands in a, in a place where it's not supposed to be and then it causes disease. But yes, we have the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. So bacteria is one of the types of microbes we have in our environment, in our bodies, in our water. Then we have the viruses. These are the problem causes we have as humans. Yeah, the ones causing us a lot of infections and diseases each now and then. And these cannot live and replicate outside a host. That is their unique characteristics for them to be vibrant, to be viable, they have to be in a host. It could be man, it could be an animal. Once they're in their host, then they will start to replicate and cause infection in the long run. Then we also have fungi. And this is where we have the yeast, the molds, the mushrooms. This play a very, very, very vital role when it comes to decomposition and nutrient cycling. But also, in the wrong place at the wrong time, then they will cause infection and disease. Another category is the protozoa. And these are single-celled organisms that live freely, but also can be parasitic in nature. Yeah, they're often found in the aquatic environments. Like said, once in the wrong place, at the wrong time, you expect a problem. But they also have the good side of them. All microbes have a good side of them, but also a bad side. Except that for viruses, the bad side outweighs the good side. Um, the last category is the algae. And these are the photosynthetic organisms. And uh, they're typically found in water. This is where they do well and flourish. Okay. And um, microbes, these are like the earliest forms of life and the ones that paved way for other organisms like plants and animals. So they have a good side of them. And this is something we always perceive that once you have a microbe, this is bad and unhealthy, it causes disease. But they really have a good side of them, like we shall see as we proceed. And importance of microbes, these play a vital role in shaping chemical and physical environments. For example, the, the fungi that are very key in decomposition of waste, but also nutrient cycling. And the second, they, are, they, are, they contribute majorly to the atmosphere by producing oxygen and fixing carbon dioxide. So in their interactions, it could be a normal biological process, for example, their feeding processes or reproduction. In this, they, they exchange gases. And in some of the reactions, you find them giving out oxygen, which is we use for respiration and absorbing carbon dioxide so that it's reducing the atmosphere. Uh, they also enable greater biomass and sustainability of life on Earth. Yeah. Microbes influence both human and planetary health, both human and plant health. Yeah, bacteria, for example, in humans, some bacteria in the right place, for example, the gut bacteria, once it's in the right place, it is healthy. It's, it's vital for the normal digestion processes. But once it is in the wrong place, it gets exposed to a wrong site, then you will have infection. But in its normal site, in its normal habitat, in once regulated well, then they also help in some biological processes in both man and also in plant health. They also, some microbes, Filter methane in oceans, reducing uh, on this gas, which is also very toxic. It results into acidic waters. So once it's filtered and regulated in the water bodies, then we also have aquatic life living healthy in there. Uh, they're also very important in decomposition, in nutrient cycling, and the symbiotic relationships with other organisms, especially when we talk of animals. They benefit so much from the symbiotic relationships with some of these microbes. Um, some of the common misconceptions, like earlier mentioned, 
we always associate microbes with disease. You hear a bacteria, you're like, no, 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 that causes disease. But there are good bacteria. There is good bacteria. Yeah, there is good fungi. Once in the right place, right amount, and right conditions it's supposed to live in. You will not have any problems. Yeah. The another misconception um, is that of the of the million microbe species, fewer than a hundred are actually harmful pathogens. So the greater percentage of, of the microbial species are actually very helpful. Once I'll again re-echo in the right amount, right living conditions, and in the right place, they will not cause you any disease. We are supposed to coexist with them. But once any is anything is altered, then we shall have a challenge. And as we go deep into this discussion, we shall appreciate that the alteration in climate, the alteration in the temperatures, in the weather patterns is the one resulting to some of these public health challenges, the diseases we are seeing, the emerging and re-emerging diseases. It's because of some of these alterations. Yeah. And um, another thing is that most microbes play crucial roles in sustaining life on Earth, from oceans, aquatic life, to plant health, to human health. These play a very vital role. We are supposed to coexist. And this is something that is always strengthened and highlighted when we talk of the One Health approach. And we shall learn to appreciate it the more and more we discuss about it. We are all supposed to coexist as man, as animals, as plants, the environment. We are all supposed to coexist once we are all at equilibrium. Once anything is altered, then we shall have a problem. And this now takes us to the next discussion, the interaction between the climate change we are seeing today and the microbes. We have seen that microbes are not only harmful, but they are also very, very important in our day-to-day -day biological processes. But once you alter anything, then there will be a problem. And this is something climate change is really, really contributing towards. Yeah. So the effects of climate change, the high temperatures, the low rainfall formations all have impact on how we live with these different five types of microbes. For example, uh, climate change alters microbial structures. And once anything is altered in any microorganism, be it bacteria or fungi, then we shall have an effect in greenhouse gas production. The best example here is the fungi. These which play a very vital role in nutrient cycling and decomposition. Once something is altered there, then their vital role in helping to absorb some of these greenhouse gases that are produced, for example, from waste decomposition, then all the gases will go through to the atmosphere and we shall have very low yields from rainfall formation. Second, there are all the changes in climate change also have led to increased prevalence and uh, climate change also leads to increased prevalence of pathogens affecting crops and livestock. So there's both new and old categories of diseases that are affecting crops and livestock due to increasing temperature or reduced precipitation, that is rainfall. Um, also, climate change contributes to development of antimicrobial resistance. This is also a very, very, very growing, actually it's now also very priority after the effects of climate change on health. It's one of the outstanding challenges we are currently facing in the health sector, antimicrobial resistance, and I'm sure we can testify at least some, if not all, that we have first or encountered a time in our life or friends or relatives who have told you, me, for example, I'll give an example for malaria treatment, me, 
a test net doesn't work on me. Me, Kowatem doesn't work for me. And this is what we are calling antimicrobial resistance. The microbes we are having right now, they're also trying to adapt to the changes in the climate, like we humans are trying to adapt. They are also trying to adapt. And in so doing, they are gaining more resistance to the already established uh, healthcare strategies and interventions that were designed. Yeah, because for example, right now the, the drugs we have in our facilities, these were these were medications that were researched on and approved based on the pathogens that were affecting human health back then. For example, penicillin. This is a drug that was established how many years ago? Um, when we look at um, at 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 Esunet, at Metha, the combinations, the co so the commonly called Coatem. This was also a drug that was developed best on a protozoa back then. Yeah. So, and these are also now trying to adapt to the effects, to the high temperatures. They're also trying to find a way of living with now the higher temperatures, the lower rainfall. And in doing this, they, they gain some resistance. Yeah? They get on other mechanisms to also adapt. So when it lands in your body, in your system, and then you get sick, they give it the medicine yeah, to try to fight against it. That was developed based on, I'll use the best example in simple terms, um, the current iPhone, yeah, that is the simplest way I can put it. You developed a medicine to target an iPhone 15, yeah, and then an upgrade came because of certain demands. Mm, for example, now here the temperature is too hot, and then they adapt and make a 16 Pro, yeah, and then you're still giving it the medicine X that you developed for a 15 it will not work because there's another extra layer, another extra future that the 16 Pro has that protects it and makes it more resistant to the medication X that you made based on the 15. So this is a very growing public health burden and we are going to also look at it, the impact it has on us. And we as young health workers, what do we do? We can straight start on research work, develop papers on this, and advise implementers on how we can best handle antimicrobial resistance and save the future humanity. Okay. And moving forward, so these are some of the areas that you can also focus on, especially for those in year one who have not yet selected research topics. It is something you can start picking interest in, uh, especially when we talk about the relationship between microbes and climate change. What are the health implications of microbial changes or microbial influences on greenhouse gases, or even how the microbes themselves are adapting to climate change. This could be a very good research that can inform the people who make drugs and uh, different interventions to, micro to pathogenic microbes to develop more resilient and reliable medications. So try to dig deep upon this. This is a very interesting uh, topic right now for all organizations, for all agencies, for all governments that you can start with and see opportunity out of. Do research about it develop papers about it, publish these papers, and you never know where it takes you, yeah? So gain more interest in this, the effects of climate change on health and also its interaction with microbes and its growing contribution to antimicrobial resistance. You can write a very good research paper on this and I know it will take you somewhere, yeah? Okay, so now let's see how these microbes are trying to adapt yeah, to the changes in climate. 
Um, microbes are also quickly adjusting mm -hmm. to these environmental changes. Excuse At me, madam. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, could you please take us a little bit back to the last slide for the research areas? Mm. Yes. You can see it. Hello. I think it's okay as well. Should they will be accessing it from the learning platform. I will be able to upload it. If it is visual to me and then I'll upload it to the platform, they'll be able to review the document from there. Okay. That will Okay, thank you. Right. Yeah. But these are broad areas, just to also put it out there. These are very broad areas. So if you're picking maybe, for example, research topic, you will not say microbial influences on greenhouse gases. This is too broad. So you have to also look to at the small, what influence you want to look at. Look at the small, small nitty gritties under this big area. This is just a research area and pick a specific topic that suits, that you can do within the shortest time of your research work that you have. Okay. Um, moving forward, how are the microbes also adopting to climate change? As humans, we are also trying to adapt to the high temperatures, to the low rainfall yields. We are trying to look for irrigation mechanisms, temperatures. We are trying to adopt all so many ways of trying to cope with the high temperatures. For the ladies, there's now a growing move of sunscreens, you know, to avoid the direct heat. But also, the microbes are also, they need to also adopt and they're adapting. And in doing so, we are having problems. Yeah. So they're also trying to, to really adjust to the harsh environmental conditions that we are having right now. Yeah. So others, they are either becoming, they're either mutating into other forms. They're undergoing mutations. It can either be genetic mutations to form a more resistant you know, self that can fight against the harsh environmental conditions. While for the others, they're just moving away from the harsh exposure and tending now to live into either a human being or trying to live more into animals or in water. And in doing so, they're also causing more and more complicated, you know, infections and diseases that we are there's some infections that are still challenging to even address and find the cause where does it come from but these are microbes just also trying to adjust to the environmental the harsh environmental conditions that we are seeing right now yeah others are just adopting through changing their day-to-day -day biological processes and activities especially and this is very common in the viruses they can all they have that ability to alter their entire microbiological activity or even shape their looks and we are also seeing right now viruses i think now are the top notch of microbes that are causing emerging new and re-emerging diseases we are grappling with right now at some point it was bacteria but right now it's now the viruses because they quickly adapt so well compared to other microbes okay and um, some of the influences of these of these microbes on greenhouse gases, as we saw up there, greenhouse gas emission is the greatest cause, the greatest contributor to climate change. So microbes, they play a role in production of some of these greenhouse gases, but also, on the other hand, absorption. So depending on if the conditions are okay, they will also help to absorb some of these and regulate them in the atmosphere. But if the conditions are harsh, then they will also, in trying to adapt, 
they also release some of these gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Looking at carbon dioxide emission as it as as an example, microbes like bacteria and fungi release in nature in their creation they are supposed to release carbon dioxide as a byproduct of their cellular respiration. And this I know we are all aware from science and. Um, <coughs> But their release is not really in high amounts to cause any problem to the atmosphere. Yeah. But once anything is, is altered in them trying to adapt to, to now the climate change, then they contribute also more in more levels, in higher levels that affects, contributes, and together with other human activities, increases the levels of carbon dioxide in the environment yeah then also during decomposition which fungi plays a very big role in decomposition during the breakdown of uh, organic matter there's also some release of some of these gases yeah and it shouldn't be so much but once it exceeds the threshold then we have a problem um, and same to the other gases for methane as well in environments where there is limited oxygen and microbes are playing the decomposition role then we have methane gas being released and this is very common in landfills where municipal councils and then cities tend to manage waste, the, the sites where the wastes are managed in cities and municipal councils. You find the lot all states, you find a lot of um, methane gas being released in some of these settings. And then when we come nitrous oxide emissions, this is very common still as well under environments with limited oxygen supply, the anaerobic environments which is also very common in agricultural practices and um, aquatic environments so microbes are good but once altered or digital or disturbed in any in any fo format in any way of life then they become a problem Okay. Any questions up to there? Okay. Um, but there is also potential. Yeah, despite all these challenges we have seen above, them trying to adopt and causing more problems, there is still hope in there that they, there is potential for them to actually also try and contribute to mitigating the effects of climate change we are observing right now. Yeah. And um, especially for the soil microbes, which are very, very vital for nutrient cycling and maintaining our nutrients in the soils for crops. This can be really utilized and protected so that we have more resilient agricultural soils, having more yields in crops. And this can be utilized here. For the nutritionists, you'll find that this is also now a growing call. We're trying to promote nutrition, healthy feeding, healthy diet, but people don't have the food. Yeah, Food security is real. It is a problem and it's everywhere right now. Access to quality food is a problem. Why? Because agricultural yields have also reduced. Getting really good yield out of of um, of what people grow is also challenging. So how can we support this? How can we contribute to this? As health workers, our work does not only end in uh, community sensitizations and awareness. Does not only end in hospitals trying to to extend healthcare services to the people, but also we have to play a very big role in conducting research, sharing findings and advocacy 
for agriculture as a sector. Yeah, it's very, very important for people to eat healthy, but if they don't have to, if they don't have what to eat, then we shall not do any good. Yeah, and this is really to the nutritionists. It is something, don't be only rigid and limited to the nutrition aspect of, of life, of health, because you're going to a community, you're going to this camp, for example, where they have resettled people who have been affected by a flood or a war, and you're teaching them how to eat healthy, you're doing a cooking demonstration. Yes, it's a good practice for nutrition as a field, but do they have what to eat is the big question. You're going to teach them and go back with your knowledge. Yeah, you've taught them, but what are they going to use to practice this knowledge on? So let's always be open and see health and see well-being and public health, public health as a whole in a broader aspect. Look at how does agriculture impact on people's health status, bringing issues of economics, bringing issues of, you know, the entire environment, literacy levels, water access. You should always be holistic in your approach, thinking about solutions to public health, thinking about solutions to ensuring that people live healthy. Don't be so rigid and limited because a number of factors come in play when you're addressing public health or generally health issues. Okay. Yeah, still this is just emphasizing the importance of microbes when it comes to the long-term storage of 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 nit of uh of oh, sorry nutrients but also vital gases in soils to promote agriculture and re reduce on the harmful use of of artificial fertilizers which is on the rise right now yeah and we can utilize these microbes in trying to really promote organic fertilizers and absorption of nutrients into the soil um this is still on how microbes can can help mitigate climate effects of climate change we have um, there's an approach called methanotrophs this is specifically to bacteria that consume methane gas yeah methane gas is one of the highly contributing greenhouse gases and um, there's a particular type of bacteria that can be introduced in some of these places where there is high emission of methane, for example, in livestock and also in sites where waste is managed, in states, in cities, which are the landfills. So this bacteria helps in reducing and consuming some of the emitted methane gas so that very little ends up into the atmosphere. So we still can use the, 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 the problem we have to solve future problems that could come out. The microbes that are adapting, we can still transform them into doing something good for the agricultural sector. Okay. Um, now we shall now dive deep into climate change and agriculture. Like I mentioned earlier, health, any health intervention currently has to be very, very holistic in nature. It has to be all round. Don't only look at treating the person. Don't only look at teaching the person how to cook or eat healthy. Don't only, you know, respond to a cholera outbreak. Look at it as a whole Look at the other sectors that could be causing the problem. So that is why in this session, we shall just briefly look at how does climate change affect agriculture and in the long run lead into the negative effects, outcomes in the health of people. Yeah. So agriculture alone currently contributes to 30 about 30 to 40% of greenhouse emission. 
and this is mainly due to the increasing agricultural mechanization. We are using a lot of machinery in the agricultural sector right now, and also the increasing use of artificial fertilizers. Yeah, because every stage of a crop we spray something to avoid the pests, to avoid the, the worms. And where do these come from? It is because of the high temperatures. They're also trying to adapt, trying to look for other sources of food. And man also wants high yield out of that tomato they have planted. So they have to spray every stage. But how much chemical are we introducing into this plant, into this fruit? Yeah, by the time you harvest it and sell with the children, especially from the nutrition perspective, you want these children to eat fresh, you know, fresh and healthy fruits and vegetables. But right now this is becoming a challenge for you to pick a, a, um, a tomato, wash it and give it to a three-year-old, a four-year-old to eat it fresh because of the scares and the worries people are now having that are being brought about to the increasing use of artificial fertilizers. You go to the market, you buy a tomato and it's purely white. Yeah, you really see that this is chemical on this tomato. And the increasing consumption of this, we also have to now bring in the health, um, the health lens in this. These are the increasing cancers we are seeing, the increasing non-communicable diseases we are seeing. And how do we contribute as health workers yeah, through our health education talks? Don't only talk about how to prevent HIV transmission, how to prevent TB transmission, but also use these platforms as avenues to talk about the untold effects of using of, of using high quantities of artificial fertilizers on the crops and fruits we are consuming. Okay. Yeah. Um, then on the other side as well, the low yields in rainfall, the extreme weather, the high temperatures are really threatening crop productivity and yields. Yeah. And this is now evident. Crop yields are really low. They're really poor and something has to be done about it. Yeah. What can the government do? What can the people in the agricultural sector do? Do they also have to sit down and develop adaptive seeds that are adapting to the harsh temperatures? But also this comes at a cost. So it's a very big dilemma for us to solve. Yeah, we need more yields, but again, we don't want the, the modified uh, seeds, the genetically modified seeds that agricultural organizations have developed for us that are really adapting to the harsh temperatures. So what next? What do we do? It's also a very big dilemma right now, and it's, it, it has to be addressed. But how? This can be told by research. Yeah, a lot of research can be done around climate change impacts. Yeah. And uh, also, rising temperatures affect wheat, rice, and maize yields. And as Africa, as a continent, we have to appreciate that cereals are our greatest base of food. We live so much on maize, we live so much on rice, we live so much on wheat. And if temperatures are really affecting this, how are we going to live in the next centuries to come? Yeah, how are we adapting to this being our main source of food, these crops being our main sources of food? How are we going to adapt to this? Still also a research dilemma there that someone can pick up for study and link it to health outcomes. Okay. And uh, the more decline in agriculture yields, the less people are consuming nutritious foods, the more malnutrition, the more poverty, the more deaths we are going to receive in our countries. And this is really not good for us as a health sector. So always be holistic, always be open, look at how the other sectors are affecting health outcomes and find 
holistic interventions to help people live healthy. Okay, now back to the gist of the matter, climate change and human health, where we now come in very, very handy. How are we contributing to this? Currently, WHO estimates 250,000 deaths annually are contributed due to the effects of climate change in one way or another. Yeah, it could be directly either a, a flood has hit somewhere and people have died, or it could be through the agriculture, no access to quality food, people are not be shown, and then it leads to a death. So it's it's really linked. Climate change is marrying a number of factors into one, and we have to really work hand in hand if we have to get good results in trying to fight this growing problem. Yeah. And um, this, for example, the rising temperatures are contributing to conditions like heat strokes, yeah, especially, and this is, this is not so, so, it's not yet so common, but it's a growing problem. People just, it just gets too hot and people get hyperthermia and people are dying because of this. And this is mainly common in, in the children and the newborns in some countries that are extremely, extremely hot. Um, then also there is the growing antibiotic resistance, the antimicrobial resistance. This is the biggest health problem we are having from climate change. Yeah, and it's complicating treatment for most of the common illnesses we had. Right now you get a flu, a flu and cold, <laughs> you need a whole, you know, regiment of medication to get fine. And yet this was something that could heal on its own. They tell you, take a spoon of honey, eat oranges, and it's gone. But right now it's getting more and more complicated. And how do we go about this? Because as, as Africa, as a continent, as South Sudan, I don't think our governments are, are, are ready to upgrade to more expensive medications because we don't have those resources. We only have the ordinary, you know, medications we had. You have flu, take a vitamin C. But right now that doesn't work on flu. It's complicated. It's, it's getting more and more tough for the health sector. And budgets are not increasing from the governments to invest in health care. So what do we do as, as health professionals who are entering um, service the next day tomorrow? This is something we have to deal with. Yeah. And um, climate change also alters the habitats, the natural habitats for microbes, and we are now starting to live more in more contact with disease vectors. There's an increase of mosquitoes. We are living a lot more with more complicated microbes. And this each and every day, the more exposure you have to these disease vectors, the more exposure you have to the pathogens, the higher the likelihood of transmitting a disease and getting an infection. Yeah. So warmer, exp uh, warmer temperatures expand, have also expanded the range of pathogens. For example, this, this, the Vibrio species, this is the, the bacteria that causes cholera, the Vibrio cholerae. We now have a lot of more strains of Vibrio cholerae and each and now they're also trying to adapt and more and more you hear a lot of cholera outbreaks left, right and center. So this is also due to the impacts of climate change. Then also the warmer oceans, the water levels are higher. We have river banks bursting. We have more infections and illnesses that are coming due to either there are waterborne diseases, yeah, there are vector-borne diseases, and all this can be prevented through public health interventions, but it's becoming more and more challenging 
due to their adaptations, they are also trying to move into live in harsher environments. So I'll pose a question here. Can can uh, can we get maybe like two volunteers? So the big the big beast right now in in our pockets as as health professionals antimicrobial resistance. This is a problem, and we can just see globally it kills about it causes about 4.9 million deaths. That is a very big number of people dying due to just a drug failing to work on them because a microbe mutated and it could not respond to a medication. This is very bad. Like uh, Betty has shared, flu right now is no longer flu. It has become something else. You treat cough for even six months and it's just recurring and recurring. So what are we doing about this? And you go to the health facility, they'll give you vitamin C. Yeah, because that was what was established years back. But right now, the influenza virus has mutated. It has become something else. We need a more advanced medication. But we have resources for this as African governments? No. So what do we do as public health professionals for this? This is now where we have to awaken up, increase research work, publish studies, and enter into advocacy push. Let's show the problem to our people in power. Tell them, fine, you're planning for maybe 20 kits of vitamin C, but according to this research paper we have done, the influenza virus has mutated and it, it will not react to this. And these are the testimonies of people. People are not curing from the remedies you're giving them. So what do you propose as a public health specialist? Let's do this. Let's do that. So we really have to up our game when it comes to research and advocacy as well. Let's not leave this to only lawyers and um, reproductive health activists, SRHR activists. We also have to stand up in other aspects of health care. Okay. Then when we look at sub-Saharan Africa alone, where South Sudan is, is, is also lies, we have up to 20, up to 24 percent of the deaths are from infections linked to resistant bacteria. This is a very big problem, and we have to address it. And some of the common examples of the resistant pathogens, we have tuberculosis, people in, uh, in HIV and TB programming. This is also their greatest cry. Multi-drug resistance tuberculosis is a problem. We have advanced to different types of medications, but nothing. Yeah, and we don't want to to move further. The further we go, the more toxicity we are introducing into healthcare. Yeah. Then we also have E. coli, mm -hmm. the, the resistant strains of E. coli, the, the, the main must of causing us ulcers and all that. Right now, I think out of 10 people, you'll find like five or six are telling you they have ulcers. Why? Why? People are eating. It's not that people are not eating, but once you're exposed to this one time, they give you the medication and then you either don't finish the dose or you play around with it, and then it's going to cause you a problem. The E. coli is going to become more resistant and there's issues. Yeah. So we also have the salmonella species, the ones causing the typhoids and all those other diarrhea diseases. What are we doing about some of these interventions? We know very well salmonella will always be there when there's a, um, a flood because of its mode of transmission, its fecal oral. But then if the medication we have to respond with is not helping the community, then people are going to die massively. And how, what do we do about it as health professionals? Let's delve deep in research because everything in science is backed up by studies and research. Once you have a good paper about this, you publish it, you advocate for it, then maybe we can get there. There are a lot of unanswered questions right now on antimicrobial resistance, and it's also a very, very rich research area 
people can delve deep in and you inform public health, governments, uh, implementing partners on how we can go about this problem. Betty also shared about malaria. This is everywhere. Right now, you are tested positive with malaria. We no longer take coatem. They have to first put you on, that, uh, on injections. After the injections, they give you a test net here. They are giving you alongside ceftriaxone. And then you enter into another dose of, what is this really? A malaria would take three tablets of coatem and the next morning you're jolly and the thing is done. You now have to just eat. It has now become a problem as well. Yeah. And it's even now more alarming for malaria because when we are talking of South Sudan, when we are talking of Sub-Saharan Africa, it's one of the leading causes of under five deaths. Yeah. And we don't want to lose our children. How do we address the malaria drug resistance? Because imagine starting a two-year-old an antesunet injection. Do you think this child in the next 10 years, if they get a malaria infection again, they will be given a coatem, for example? It will not work because you've started them already on a high, on a higher class of drugs. Yeah. So health education and awareness is very key when it comes to antimicrobial resistance. Yeah. And some of the key drivers of this plague is the over-the-counter ant antibiotic use. We have a habit. We became our, our own doctors. You feel a headache. You just run to the pharmacy and you buy a Panado you take. Actually, even Panado people are not even starting. Me, Panado doesn't work on me. You get me a higher class of drug of, of a painkiller. But where are we heading with this? You have, you have started taking that higher drug, but the day you will not have money to purchase it and you want to get back to a Panado, then you're at the resistance to this Panado. What are you going to do next? Yeah. So over-the-counter sales of antibiotics is a very big problem. And sometimes we shouldn't blame the people doing this because it's either they went to a health facility and they told them we don't have this in stock, or they're even not aware. For those who have the resources, they are not aware that this is a problem. You feel, you go to a lab, they tell you have malaria, and then you tell them, give me half dose of this, because that's what you can afford. But where does it take us? Yeah, you're causing more problem to yourselves. So it is a very big driver of antimicrobial resistance. At least um, more advanced countries have made this very, very strict. For example, in German, you cannot move to a pharmacy until the person give me a painkiller. No, they will never sell you that painkiller. They will always ask you for a doctor's prescription. But as here in Africa, you just wake up, go to a clinic, go to a pharmacy. Everyone just wakes up and sets up a drug shop and you buy what you want and swallow. Yeah, but in developed countries, you will never get served when you do not have a doctor's prescription and signed and authorized. Yeah. And I think these are some of the advocacy points we need to use as public health professionals. You tell them you don't have a prescription in a pharmacy. We are not selling to you this drug, but we are always money oriented and which is killing us as, as, as a continent, as, as nations. Yeah. And two, we also don't have comprehensive surveillance systems. And when I speak of surveillance, this is ongoing collection of data, of information, and disseminating it to, to people, to, to relevant bodies to respond towards it. We don't have this. So having a surveillance system that is just monitoring antimicrobial resistance and say in this hospital, we admitted 20 people with malaria and 10 did not respond to our test unit, they are resistant. We don't have this system in place to inform antimicrobial resistance monitoring. Yeah. Um, and other communities, other societies have 
they may have counterfeit drugs. People are selling a lot of counter substandard and counterfeit drugs because they are cheap. Yeah, or because they got them on black market for even no cost and they want to make up no more profits. And you're having people consume these substandard drugs. It's going to get back to us as, as, as a population, as a community, which is not good. Yeah. Then also a very big problem is inadequate knowledge about microbial antimicrobial resistance. Let's blow this as a problem in our communities. Once you get an opportunity to talk to the people, to talk to the community, always bring it out because it's a growing problem. And lastly, we also don't have adequate laboratory capacities and healthcare infrastructure that can easily detect and manage resistant infections. Yeah. Okay, questions up to there? Okay, they're not there. Um, some of the mechanisms that are really amplifying the spread of antimicrobial resistance. Now we have environmental factors, the higher the temperatures, the higher the rates of resistant strains. And also we have um, the gene exchanges, the, gene, the genetic mutations, which are being adopted by most of these organisms to try and adopt the bacteria. And we have a lot of this right now, genetic mutations as well. Then also wastewater, uh, poor management of, of liquid waste, urban wastewater. This is also a very great mechanism of spreading some of these um, mutated and resistant strains of microbes. We also have environmental risks which, uh, for example, resistant bacteria can enter the ecosystem through either public water supplies or irrigation. For example, at household level, you can try your best, you boil your water for drinking, you, you, you do all the measures to avoid, for example, diarrhea disease. But then what about the waters we are using, for example, for brushing our teeth? Is it boiled water? This is always also a point that we always neglect. So you may try your best and then there's just that one loophole of the social amenity we are using, like for example, public water supply, that may cause you a problem in your household. So this is not a one man's job. Like I said, it has to be holistic as you're going to respond to a problem, involve other sectors and you move as a team so that as you're doing the nutrition, the health, the, the reproductive health component, the public health component, there's also someone doing the water, clean water access component, there's someone doing the agricultural quality food access component. And so that we try to really address this challenge as a team from all angles and we don't leave any loophole for the to flourish. Okay. Um, and then looking at vector-borne diseases, um, malaria being one of them, we have this growing as well. Uh, like also Betty had put it out there, temperatures, have really affected them in their natural habitats and they're also trying to get more cooler places to stay. And we have a lot of mosquitoes and these in warmer temperatures, they also reproduce quite high and also in cooler temperatures, which have also reduced now. So it's really a dilemma for us, really, really, really a dilemma for us as health professionals, and we have to awaken. And in doing so, um, globally, countries came together and tried to, uh, they didn't try, but they came and also appreciated, they came together and appreciated the effects of climate change on health 
and sat and came up with an agreement that will, that is being implemented by all the countries that signed that agreement. And that is the Paris Agreement. This is now what we are implementing as countries globally to try and see how we really reduce the effects of climate change. This was adopted in 2015, yeah, in the COP Paris, 20, um, 20, the 21st COP in, that was held in Paris meeting. And its core goal is to limit temperature rise below two degrees Celsius. So we aim to at least, if the worst comes to the worst, at least we have a temperature of 1.5, rise of 1.5 degrees centigrade. So this is an agreement that all countries who participated in this came together and had the common understanding that climate change is a problem. And we have to commit to certain interventions on how we respond to this. So the Paris Agreement was the first move that was done. And it's that those were the commitments, limit temperature rise to below one uh, to below two degrees Celsius, and also strengthen the resilience and adapt to climate. Um, resilience and adaptation to climate impacts. That's why you see right now it's a global move. Everyone is talking about how do we strengthen resilience, climate change adaptation. It rose from the Paris Agreement. So all the countries that committed and signed the agreement, they submit um, NDCs. These are the nationally determined contributions. So a country agrees and puts up climate action plans and say, Okay, our, our action plans, climate action plans for this year, we are going to do this in the agriculture sector. We are going to, in the health sector, we shall do this. In the sector, we shall do this. And they are presented to the general committee. Or they present their commitments to the general committee and these are monitored. Yeah. Um, so the implementation, Countries have to report and implement the activities they have submitted in the in the in the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs. Then every five years, a progress review is conducted. Yeah, and then also commitment to fight to finances just to climate action was also committed, and this has been mobilized and has been raised. There is money to address issues of climate change. And then also the developed countries have to support developing countries to meet their national objectives. So this can be either technical support or financial support. Yeah. Then um continuously, the COP conferences always happen with the latest that happened last year in Dubai. I uh, hope we all try to listen in and, and um, learn about the commitments. If you have not, you can just uh, read more about the commitments that came out of this, of this engagement last year and see where your country stands and see what was committed for your country, how much resources were committed for your country and also what the government pledged to do in regards to climate change. These are some of the aspects we can start from when it comes to advocacy and writing papers about the impacts of climate change on health. Because every country commits, we shall do this and do this, and they are given resources. But how much is done? What is done? Yeah, And this is where we can contribute. OK. Yeah. Um, if there is anything, questions, contribution, you could be wanting to share a scenario or something you found interesting on your end, kindly do so.